Yes. The idea for my talk today has its roots in an article I published on anthropomorphic representations of the Hittite kings three years ago in the Journal of Near Eastern Studies. While conducting the research for that article, I came to realize how few and selective were royal representations in Hittite art. Furthermore, the more I looked into the corpus, the more I could not help but feel that these few representations of the king had a sense of loneliness to them. The only engagement the king got was with the divine world, while in most cases he seemed to be abundant, uh, abandoned by his peers. This singularity of the king, quote unquote, uh, as I have came to call it over the last few months, is vividly contrasted by the abundance of the divine world. In the Hittite <clears throat> world, the gods and goddesses are everywhere. They are figures adorn more landscape monuments than those of kings. Their poses are more diverse, and we can see even multiples of them uh, on the same scene, as you see here from Chamber B in Yazilikaya. So today in my talk, I will delve more into this specific contrast, the case of royal singularity versus divine multiplicity. And I will argue that it was an imperial strategy that benefited the Hittite king in carving for himself a privileged and calculated position between the mortal and the divine realms that could not be contested by others. I will come back to and unpack all these points in detail uh, in the following minutes. Uh, to appeal to a broad audience today, uh, I will start my talk with a brief detour on Hittite empire and the general traits of its art. I will situate us in space and time, and I will discuss major themes and the various media on which they are depicted. I will then zoom in on representations of deities and kings in more detail, specifically focusing on the idea of singularity versus multiplicity. The Hittite state came into existence on the central Anatolian plateau in the mid 17th century BCE. Its starting point and the core of its centralized power throughout its life was the area within the band of the Kızılırmak River, uh, right here. For the first two centuries of its existence, the ventures of the Hittite state took it as far as Babylon in Mesopotamia, but these successes were short-lived. Starting with the early 14th century BCE, however, Hittites started exhibiting imperial ambitions. A large portion of Anatolia, including Cilicia and Tarhuntasa in the south, as well as northern Syria, was brought under Hittite control either directly or through vassal kingdoms. Areas to the west, east, and north of the political core in central Anatolia were precariously governed and shifted alliances, but yet Hittites remained the dominant and the only centralized power in Anatolia. In accordance with this shift, Hittite history is dominantly seen as a two-part endeavor, a modest kingdom followed by an ambitious empire, although there are also people who read this as two successive empires, uh, one following the failure of the first. Art produced during both of these political formations are studied as Hittite arts, and I will be using examples from uh, all five centuries of Hittite craftsmanship in my talk today. And although I don't have time to go into that in my talk today, uh, it is also debated if Hittite art is a good um, name to categorize all these um, art, works of art that we are looking at. Uh, and uh, this is something that I keep in mind, but cannot engage in this talk uh, today. The most common themes represented in Hittite art are uh, deities either by themselves or as recipients of libations and offerings, or with multiple other divine figures. The natural world, including animals that were sacred for the major deities in the pantheon. Festivals and rituals uh, celebrated by participants, occasionally involving musicians, athletes, and religious personnel. Athletic games, including bull jumping that is well known from contemporary Aegean contexts. Hunting scenes depicting both humans, animals, and flora. And finally, rulers, both the royal couple of the Hittite state, but also princes and local rulers from the neighboring kingdoms. While these are all visible on the city wall of Alajahuyuk, which depicts a ritual celebration in multiple friezes, 
there is a varied set of media that Hittite craftsmen favored. Hittite art, <coughs> excuse me, Hittite art most dominantly used living or quarried rock surfaces, statue and statuettes fashioned out of metal, stone or ivory, vessels of clay or metal, and surfaces of stamp or cylinder seals reflected on their impressions. After this admittedly very, very brief survey of the major types of evidence we have of Hittite art, I will now focus on representations of gods and goddesses, and then those of kings, while engaging with ideas of singularity and multiplicity. Let's start with the world of the divine. With a pantheon hosting hundreds of deities, the Hittites often referred to and invoked their thousand gods in their treaties and ritual texts. We have a diverse corpus of images of these gods. Many representations carved on rock surfaces are preserved, as well as statuettes, images on seals, seal impressions, and vessels bearing figural decoration. On these, deities are represented with both more global symbols of divinity, such as caps with horns, and also specific markers of their realm, such as mountain gods depicted as mountain from the base down, as you see here on the screen on this example. One big gap in our data is cult statues. Produced of valuable materials, these statues would be objects of veneration and a recipient of cult offerings at temples. Hittite texts make it clear that a large number of such statues, statues were in circulation. The detailed instructions laid out for priests and temple personnel in the text CTH 264 enumerate the ways in which God should be looked after in the temples, including as minute detail as the purity of the breads offered to them. These gods in temples were cult statues, which were believed to be not mere representations, but divine themselves. This is clear from the old Hittite texts, making ample mention of god napping, i.e. the taking of the cult statues of local gods from the temples of conquered cities, and their bringing and setting up at the temples in the center of the empire. As convincingly argued by Amir Gilan, this practice seems to have come to an end in the 15th century BCE, when the Hittites incorporated a ritual from the Kizuvatna region into their religious practice, enabling them to worship the same deity in multiple places. This also enabled the Hittites to have a cult dedicated to the major gods of the pantheon in multiple cities. There was a storm god of Aleppo and a storm god of Nerik, and multiple other storm gods of other locations. The best known example of a divine figure dividing her essence is a text describing the adlocation of the goddess of the night. In this text, um, the deity is called Honored Deity. Preserve your being, but divide your divinity. Come to that new temple too, and take yourself the honored place. And when you make your way, then take yourself only that place. Through a series of elegant and symbolic rituals following this invocation, the essence of the goddess was then transported from the old temple to the new one, where she was now set up separately as yet another incarnation of the one and only goddess of the night. In the Hittite world, deities could also be symbolized through the statues of their sacred animals. On the Olajahuyuk city wall, for example, we see a statue of a bull, the sacred animal of the storm god, as the recipient of the reverent gesture of the king and the queen. Here, the bull could be the storm god as much as the anthropomorphic representations of the same deity, as, for example, seen on a seal impression of Muatali II. The divine in the Hittite context was thus polymorphic and distributed. Gods could be represented in a myriad of ways, ranging from anthropomorphic to zoomorphic, and they likely had more than one image at any given point. The text of adlocation of the goddess of the night urges us to understand all of these images as not mere representations, nor as parts of the divine, but as the divine. In other words, we need to understand each of these images as but one incarnation of a single divine figure, bringing us to the concept of divine multiplicity. <clears throat> 
I define multiplicity in this context as the ability to spawn an infinite number of selves in an identical condition without compromising the integrity of the original divine presence. From this perspective, no individual representation of a deity was isolated. It was related and itself the larger divine essence, draped over the land of Hati as a network in which each image or symbol of the god constituted one nexus. The thousand gods of Hati were also multiple in the sense that several of them could act together for a common cause and they could travel in packs. The open-air sanctuary of Yazilikaya is an outstanding example of the Hittite tradition of rendering the deities in multiplicity. In Chamber B, the gods of the underworld are represented in procession. The 12 deities are wearing identical clothing, they are identical in size, and they give the impression of moving in perfect unison. These gods define an indivisible whole whose strength does not come from the singularity of them as deities, but from the safety they find in numbers. The main chamber of Yazlikaya depicts two such processions, one of goods, gods and another one of goddesses, walking towards and culminating in the central scene, where the storm god Teshub and the, Teshub and the sun goddess Hebat meet. In carved registers throughout the chambers, gods and goddesses walk by the visitors. The rhythm, repetition, and sheer number of these figures weave the space together and direct the visitor to the central scene marked here with the orange box. The walking gods and goddesses thus mimic the bodily experience of the ancient and the modern visitor. In the central scene, where the chief deities of the Hittite pantheon, the storm god and the sun goddess meet, the gods and goddesses continue to draw strength from multiplicity. Recurring elements such as headgears, for example, of the goddesses here, just continuing to repeat, and the gods, the horned caps, uh, mimicking each other. Uh, the recurring sign, hieroglyphic sign for god that you see next to each figure uh, which precedes, sort of tops, the name of the god or goddess, but everyone has this marker for god. The mountain peaks and animals the deities step on, the staffs they carry, and the repeated linearity visible on the skirts, the headgears, and the animals visually weave the scene into a whole. Like the marching gods of the underworld in the other chamber that we previously looked at, this group of gods represent an indivisible whole, even with the singular markers and names of each god. This ability of the gods to move in multitude is also represented in Hittite texts. In his ten-year annals, King Mursili II relates to multiple conquests that he made. For example, I then went on to the town Isupita and I attacked the town Paluissa. Behind the town Paluissa, the Pishuvarian enemy stepped into battle against me and I fought him. The sun goddess of Arinna, my lady, the mighty storm god, my lord, Mezula, and all the gods ran before me and I destroyed the Pishuvarian enemy behind the town Paluissa. Then I burned down the town. The idea of gods running in unison before the Hittite king and his army, in a way clearing the way for him to perform the conquest, is a recurring theme in royal rhetoric. In their capacity as leaders and guides of the king, the gods were not only powerful on their own, but also could have devastating impact when moving in rhythm, again as an indivisible whole. Let me now turn to royal singularity. In representations of Hittite art of the empire period, the king is visibly given a liminal existence between the planes of the mortal and the divine. The frieze on the silver vessel in the form of a fist depicts a religious ceremony in which the king is pouring libations to the storm god. He is followed by a line of attendants, four musicians and a staff bearer. As with the marching gods of Yazlikaya, the musicians are brought together with small intervals between them, as well as repeating linear elements, such as garment lines, the wires of the lyres, and the staff. 
Before I delve in a more detailed analysis of the scene on this vessel, I want to take a moment to say that this unfortunately lacks provenance. It was bought off the art market in London and gifted to the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, uh, which is all credited on the MFA catalog page. We thus have no information about its <coughs> original context of deposition and cannot go beyond um, well-informed speculation beyond, on its function. Now, if we analyze the scene in more detail, we quickly come to realize that different types of beings represented in the scene occupy their own dimensions, and these are separated by certain limits. On either side of the frieze are gods, the storm god with his sacred bulls on the one end, and a mountain god that is depicted as part mountain on the other. The circular frieze executed on the rim of the vessel allowed them to share what seems like a masonry feature, maybe a tower symbolizing a city. So there is uh, this that they are sharing, and there is only one of these, uh, which is repeated in drawing, but this just comes together again in the uh, circular rim of the vessel. They include their supernatural markers, such as a pair of divine bulls or a skirt made up of an actual mountain. In between them stretch a group of five humans. As I argued just before, they are visually represented and perceived as a group, thematically through their carrying of musical instruments and a staff, and visually through their clothing, headdress, and postures. If we, for instance, focus on their hand gesture for a second, it's easy to realize that they all have both arms and hands elevated on their front in the exact same manner. The only remaining figure in the scene is the king. He is unmistakably labeled as such with hieroglyphic Luvian signs reading Great King Tutalia. He is pouring libations to the storm god and is facing him directly. His dress is more ornate than the attendants, but he is wearing similar clothing. Contrasting the upward bodily motion of the attendants, the king's body is gesturing down in line with the libation he is pouring for the god. The various symbols located between figures clearly guide us to perceive the king, the attendants, and the gods as separate entities. On this scene, it is perfectly evident that the king occupied a liminal plane of existence between that of the mortals and the gods. He was not just any mere mortal. He could interact face to face with the divine. And yet, this interaction had its limits. The king was not fully divine, he was a singularity. I define singularity as the quality of the self to be indivisible and without any readily available alternatives. As opposed to the endless possibilities of multiplicity, singularity is a precarious and vulnerable existence. It needs to be carefully protected as the disruption of this kind of singularity, such as the death of a king, requires a tedious series of rituals for crafting singularity anew in another individual. <coughs> Hittite kings lived as mortals and became deified after death. The royal funerary ritual was a 14-day affair in which the body of the king was cremated along with other paraphernalia and was transmitted to the afterlife to take his place among the gods. As such, as I already started to suggest, the king stood on the threshold of the mortal and the divine realms. His visual representations sought to reinforce this status. In their anthropomorphic representations, Hittite kings are depicted wearing two different types of attire, uh, which has been categorized in previous literature as ceremonial and martial. When in their ceremonial regalia, kings wear long dresses, shoes with curled toes, rounded caps, and hold curved wands called the kalmus. These are all attributes of the sun god, one of the chief gods of the state, the title of whom, literally my son, the Hittite language utilized for the word majesty. When depicted in their so-called martial outfits, a second major role of the Hittite king was being emphasized. The king as the general of the army, leading the annual military campaigns under the protection of the gods. This role of the king as warrior is utilized in some rock reliefs and seals, where the kings are dressed in conical pointed hats and short skirts, 
<coughs> and they carry lenses and bows on their shoulders. These are all attributes borrowed from the depictions of martial gods and the storm god. Except for the weapons the king is carrying, however, the so-called martial image contains no visual clues about military engagement. Furthermore, uh, from the royal tom tombs of Olajahuyuk to the royal cemetery of Ur and the shaft graves of Mycenae, there are royal graves containing burials of daggers and swords made of precious metals such as gold. These items, which would be utterly impractical as weapons in a warfare context, are to be understood as ceremonial regalia, symbolic nods to the military power of the state and its chief general, seeking to imbue him with political capital rather than brute statements of physical prowess. In Mesopotamian iconography, there was a strong tradition of depicting kings fighting the enemy. Examples are countless, and on the screen I just give you two. Um, the Seely of Vultures, which is not here, showing King Eanatum's victory over the city of Umma, the victory of Seely of Naramsin, you see on the left, portraying the Akkadian king proudly killing the Lulubi, or countless reliefs exhibiting Neo-Assyrian kings attacking and subduing enemies of all kinds, human and animal. <coughs> Sorry. Similarly, Egyptian pharaohs commissioned many reliefs and sculptures rendering them as warriors, uh, from the Narmer palette early on to uh, the uh, iconography of Ramesses II on various pylons of temples. Contrary to these other Eastern Mediterranean traditions, the Hittite king is almost never depicted engaged in confronting enemies. In the so-called martial images, the king either stands alone or in the company of the gods, never engaged in active battle. Hittite texts, however, are full of records of annual campaigns, battles, and suppressed rebellions. I have already given an example from the ten-year annals of Mursili II, for instance, where the king talked about running into battle as led by gods and burning down cities. The stark contrast between the textual and figural treatments of warfare calls the martial nature of these depictions in question. Because of this, I will present another kind of typology for studying the images of Hittite kings. One based on different kinds of actions, the king facing a deity and either saluting or libating to him, i.e. the divine encounter. The king under the protection by a, of a deity, i.e. the embrace scenes and the king finally portrayed alone, which I suggest is when he's a god himself, i.e. the god king. In discussing these, I'm indebted to previous engagements with these images, uh, including but not limited to a 2007 article on the divine image of the king by Dominic Bonatz, a 2012 article by Petra hodejo on the possibility of iconoclasm on Hittite artistic objects, Kay Kohlmeyer and Horst Ehringhaus's detailed catalogues of Hittite landscape monuments, an article by Jürgen Zeher uh, discussing these landscape monuments akin uh, as seals uh, on the landscape, Umur Harmanshah's publications on landscapes and relationships to these monuments, Stephen Lumsden's doctoral dissertations on symbols of power in Hittite royal iconography, uh, Suzanne Herbert, Celia Mora, and Hans Guterbrock's studies on glyptic, uh, and also the studies of general uh, Hittite art uh, by Muhibe Darga, Asla Özyar, uh, to name just a few. I mean, there's uh, a lot more, uh, but I just wanted to single some of these out, as it is difficult in a talk uh, uh, context where I am reading my references, I'm seeing them, but I'm not reading them out loud. So, to start with the divine encounter, uh, three examples depict kings encountering the divine. On the city wall of Alajahuyuk, the king is shown saluting the statue of a bull representing the storm god. In Fraktin, Hattusili III is shown libating to the storm god in front of an altar. On the silver vessel in the form of a fist, which I already discussed in detail, Tutalia is followed by a line of attendants and is pouring libations before an altar of the storm god. One thing that I did not discuss uh, in relation to the scene, I'd like to add now. The posture of the king and the standing god in this representation prioritize only the king in the encounter with the divine. 
while the king has no physical or visual contact with the attendants or um, also physical and uh, physical contact with the god. The honor of being visually depicted in direct engagement with the gods belonged to the Hittite king, but this engagement had its limits. In the examples of divine encounter in all of the scenes that you see here, there is an altar between the mortal and the immortal, marking the different territories of the king and the divine. Thus, the libation scenes demonstrate a divine interaction in which the king is directly facing a god, but still standing in a separate space. In the mortal plane occupied by the king and others, he was the only one depicted as directly encountering the deity. Performing in honor of and in front of the gods clearly established a bond between the divine and the royal, making these images politically embedded statements. The second mode of representation of the Hittite king is the type of scene known as the embrace, where the king is in the protective hug of a deity. As opposed to the encounter scenes where the king and the god confront each other, the king is almost absorbed by the god in the embrace scenes, and both figures look like parts of one indivisible unit. This is clearly visible in the legs and the feet, and they seem to overlap, and most scenes demonstrate only three feet instead of four, which you can uh, clearly see on this uh, seal impression. As a motive, the embrace scenes makes up most of the anthropomorphic representations of Hittite kings and is dominantly found on stamp seals. The earliest embrace scene representation of the Hittite king on seals dates to the reign of Muwattali II. Multiple impressions of a single seal and its variations depict the king in the embrace of the storm god. Behind the king, here, the hieroglyphic Luvian signs read Great King Muwattali. Before the deity, the storm god is spelled out. Like the divine encounter, the embrace scenes clearly made a statement about the status of the Hittite king as an individual, not only chosen, but also protected by the chief gods of the state. From this perspective, these representations are not that much different than some well-known uh, examples of the Mesopotamian canon, such as the ruler receiving the rod and the ring of kingship from a deity, or the king as a pious builder building in honor of the gods. In the representations I term the god king, the king is depicted as divine himself, marked either by iconographic details in his martial attire, such as wearing a horned cap, or through a post-mortem context while depicted in his ceremonial regalia. As I briefly <clears throat> discussed earlier in this talk, Hittite kings and queens were not perceived to be divine themselves, but became gods upon death. The text of the royal funerary ritual describe in detail the actions needed to be undertaken in a particular order to facilitate the transition of the king or queen from the mortal realm to the divine. On the first day of the 14-day ritual, the body was cremated. The deceased royal was then channeled into an effigy for the rest of the funeral. The effigy not only acted as the deceased through a substitute ritual, but also lacked his or her fragilities, such as a decaying of the corpse. After the body was cremated and channeled into the effigy, specific items that were deemed to be important for the afterlife were sent to the netherworld by means of consumption with fire. A contextual reading of these kind of anthropomorphic representations reveal them to be images of the god king who has gone through this ordeal of uh, becoming a god. At Sirkeli, Muwattali II is depicted without any seeming divine attributes, and you can see uh, the king here in ceremonial regalia uh, with a rounded cap uh, and no clearly divine markers. But I, I would like to suggest that this is a post-mortem setting, and I am not the first one to suggest this. Uh, the Sirkeli team has been already putting uh, this idea forward. The relief is connected with a monumental building built into a rock outcrop with cup marks, which are known to be related to practices of pouring liquid offerings. There also was a second relief of possibly Mursili III, Muatali II's son, or Krunta, his brother, that had been erased in antiquity, 
It is plausible to read Sirkeli as a site of sustained ancestor cult for Muwattali II, whose memory overtook the significance of the figure in the erased relief. It is thus not possible to discuss Muwattali as a deified king in life, but we can be more certain that the particular image carved on Sirkeli was referencing the king after his death in his deified state. <coughs> a more definitive case for deification can be found in the reign of Tutalia IV, one of the final kings of the empire. In the representation of Tutalia IV in Yazilikaya, the king is shown standing on two mountains, an attribute of divinity, while his name in hieroglyphic Luvian stretches below a drawing of the winged sun disk that you can see right here. The mountains in these reliefs mark divine status and clearly situate the body of the king in the divine realm. It is possible that Chamber B in Yazilikaya was the final resting place for the ashes of Tutalia IV, making this image a funerary portrait. However, textual evidence might also suggest that Tutalia IV was deified during his lifetime. Emirgazi altars erected during the reign of the king mention votive offerings to be made to him, making it possible to suggest that the king was already receiving cult offerings uh, before his death. The divine status of Tutalia IV, as symbolized with the horned caps, is visible even in the embrace scenes, uh, such as his, on his slender seal, where both the god and the king are wearing matching hats and outfits. In this respect, however, Tutalia IV's reign towards the very end of the empire represents an anomaly rather than the norm. Up until his reign, kings walked a fuzzy line between mortals and gods, and I will come back and discuss the implications of this in, uh, in my conclusions in a little bit. Beyond these preserved examples of royal representation, I want to point out one final, final piece of evidence we have, which is textual references of royal statuary, which was archaeologically not preserved. A good example is Putuhepa's prayer to the sun goddess of Arinna and her circle for the well-being of Hattusili. And she says, if you, Lilwani, my lady, will speak favorably to the gods and will keep your servant Hattusili alive and grant him long years, months and days, I shall come and make for Lilwani, my lady, a silver statue of Hattusili, as big as Hattusili himself, with its head, its hands and its feet of gold that I will weigh out separately. So um, even in these uh, examples that are not archaeologically preserved, there is still this interaction between the king's body and the divine. The statue is being uh, fashioned as a favor, as an um, offering to the gods, and also it would be very likely set up in a temple context. So now if we come back and evaluate the visual representations of the king altogether, we see that there is always a divine element in the scene. The king is either in the company of the gods or is a god himself. On an ontological level, the manifestation of the king's bodily form only in the presence of divine energy was a deliberate choice to reinforce the legitimacy of a specific individual to occupy the office of kingship. The anthropomorphic representations of the Hittite king thus served a specific set of purposes in which the relationship between the king and the divine realm was articulated and the resulting royal authority was communicated. This privileged position of the king, however, also made him a singularity. This threshold that the Hittite king occupied on his own was a precarious and lonely existence. I would like to suggest that this too was a deliberate choice and even an imperial strategy to make sure there was only one individual at any given time that was de facto fit to rule. As a singularity, the Hittite king was on the one hand alone, but on the other hand, uh, non-interchangeable. He had no alternatives and that made him the legitimate one to rule. To rule. So now if we um, look at um, 
again, the some of the um, attributes of these images, uh, for example, the way the Hittite king Hattusili III is depicted on this image from the relief on Fractin. Uh, we see that uh, in some of the reliefs, uh, this singularity position, this not mortal, but also not divine, is also uh, very deliberately used, and I call this a calculated ambiguity. Uh, if we look at the scene, there's a lot of similarities between the attire of the king and the god. Uh, there is uh, the idea of the presence of divine markers. We could very well argue that the horned cap of Hattusili III, uh, the cap of Hattusili III has uh, the horn in the same way, exact same way that uh, the storm god has. And uh, also in uh, other scenes that I have shown you, such as embrace scenes, the king and the god melted together. Uh, these were all creating what I call a calculated ambiguity that came with the position of singularity afforded to the king. In some of these representations, the viewer could be confused about whether or not the king was a god. And I have to say for Fractin, there is also some discussion about if this also is a postmortem image, because the king really seems to be more of a god than the king. Uh, but I think we can call this fuzziness uh, as also a deliberate choice and was part of the imperial arsenal of casting the king as a singularity. I would also give him enough leeway to look as just divine or truly mortal on any given day to serve his purposes. If anybody came to, uh, um, let's say, accuse him of uh, acting like a god and thinking that he is himself the god, he could very well just say, well, no, you are just taking me for a mistake and I am the chief priest of the god, I'm not a god myself. Uh, or if anybody tried to treat him as a mere mortal, he could very well say, well, I am the chief um, priest of the king, I am in touch with the divine world. So there was a spectrum of ambiguity between the divine and the mortal that the king could actively draw from depending on his uh, agenda. And this, I think, is very well represented in uh, visual image, visual repertoire. This point also becomes clearer when we put all the visual representations we have talked about in historical perspective. A genre of material that I just mentioned at the beginning, uh, namely the relief vases made of terracotta, uh, were the hallmark of Hittite art in the 16th century BCE. These vessels depicted multiple celebrations, rituals, and festivals. In other ways, uh, we have a, a demonstration of multiple friezes uh, that um, give us the scene of a celebration. We have musicians like we have seen on the uh, silver vessel uh, in the form of a fist. Uh, we have athletes, uh, acrobats jumping. Uh, on the bottom, we have uh, a scene in which uh, we see cooking in a probably in a kitchen setting. And then there are multiple images like this one here and then and um, also, uh, yes, multiple, definitely this one here and this one here, in which we see an individual saluting the divine, and especially here, an individual libating to a god. And this is uh, something that we have seen the Hittite king do in the imperial period. However, in the 16th century context, early on in the history of the Hittite states, uh, if this individual is the king, he looks like just like the other individuals. So he is not uh, that much different. But if he is not the king, then somebody else is doing his job. So throughout the 14th and the 13th centuries, however, when we jump back to the imperial period, as the empire was expanding, the Hittite kings developed a distinct iconography of anthropomorphic representations, labeling themselves with their names written in hieroglyphic Luvian and following the conventions of the three modes that I discussed above. These representations are directly related and manifested with divine energy and work the threshold between the mortal and the divine realms um, in what I called a calculated ambiguity. This changes again in the reign of Tutalia IV, where the king is now visibly a god and the ambiguity is no more. So how did royal singularity benefit the Hittite king during the 14th and the 13th centuries BCE? He is 
in that case, uh, when we talk about the singularity of this individual, his being one of a kind and not having any alternatives, means that the king was something of a precarious individual who needed to be protected, who needed to be looked after by the gods and the people alike, and who had this non-disputable, and this is the key because of his legitimacy, non-disputable uh, status between the gods and the mortals. But he also could draw support and legitimacy from an abundant and vivid world of gods and goddesses that he could mobilize in war and conquest and in legitimizing himself as the beloved of the thousand gods of Hati. <coughs> so in this talk, I suggested that the divine world in Hittite visual repertoire is one of multiplicity. Deities could divide their essences to inhabit new statues and temples. Multiple gods of exact size, gender, and attire could fulfill the same position, like the gods of the underworld, and the same god could have multiple incarnations in multiple cities. Mere mortals, in a similar way, could be multiple. While I did not have time to dwell too much on the mortals beyond the king, similar to the gods, the mortals of the divine world are many and sometimes even interchangeable. In between these two worlds, not entirely divine, but not entirely mortal, there was the king, a singularity, who had the very um, nice position of being a one-off individual, but who could draw from a very abundant, vivid, and ultimately powerful world of divine multiplicity uh, that he could draw from for support. Uh, thank you very much for uh, your attention. Yes, thank you very 